Hello. Hi. How's everyone doing? Hope you're enjoying reInvent. This is Architecture 307 Infrastructure as Code. My name is David Winter. On the stage with me today, I've got Alex Corley. We're both from Amazon Web Services. We also have a customer on stage with us, Tom Juanlista from Simple, a very disruptive uh, startup in the banking industry. Today we're going to talk about, as I said, infrastructure as code, something that I'm very passionate about. A little quote, a little something about me. I don't normally test, but when I do, I test in production. I didn't make this up, but it just kind of explains the history of my career. So, so to, to take you down the, the path that, that I learned about infrastructure as code and to maybe explain a little bit about this quote that I like so much, I'm going to tell you guys a story. I came from an enterprise background, uh, building on-prem data centers, networking, uh, virtualization, et cetera, like many of us in the room today. Uh, I had an opportunity to go down to Austin, which is a great place for startups, and I was given the chance to really, in the latitude, to really explore options in building a software as a service application for startup down in Austin. And the great thing about that was you know, I had like three months to really stick my head up inside the cloud and decide, do I want to build this on-prem where I'm comfortable, where I know what's going on, or do I want to experiment and go out to the cloud and build something new and interesting? Well, as we're all here and you can expect, I chose Amazon Web Services, and I love Amazon Web Services. Uh, the reason that we ended up choosing Amazon Web Services was flexibility, agility, et cetera, the ability, the ability to get started very quickly at a very low cost, all very important things for a startup. It was just me in the very beginning, by myself. Didn't have a team yet. So we started, or I started, very simple, like everyone does when they're starting out with Amazon Web Services. You log into the console after opening your account. You start spinning up instances by hand in the console. And you know maybe you spin up an M3X large one day. Maybe you spin up a T2 small the next day, however it goes. And as I was doing this and iterating on this and building this SaaS application, I was realizing that you know I'm not going to meet my deadline. I'm not going to figure out how to get this application into the cloud fast enough if it's just me hammering away at a keyboard using the console. I needed to be faster. I needed more speed. So after exploring and finding out, you know, you know every day you find out some new and wonderful thing about Amazon Web Services, I figured out about the, the API, and I figured out about the command line interface. And being the amazing developer that I am, I built a great bash script an amazing bash script that I'm very proud of, and it was my evolution from the console to infrastructure as code. And, and it was, still, it was just me, but this allowed me to iterate on building my instances much faster and much more programmatically. Well, still just being me, I needed more people on the team, and so we started to hire. And so as I hired Alex, senior developer, Alex came in and we started working together, and you know, we, we did things a little bit differently in the console. right? We did things a little bit differently based on my bash script. So what happened was I handed the bash script entire control of it over to Alex. And well, after Alex got up the floor laughing at my bash code, he re-implemented the entire thing in Python using the Boto API to interact with the cloud. So this wasn't just a, this wasn't just a code upgrade. This wasn't just throwing away some ugly bash script and, and replacing it with very pretty Python. It was actually bringing in some methodologies of real developers, right? Code versioning, unit testing. All that great stuff, storing everything in a code repository, branching it off, testing in different ways. Again, we, we thought we were on top of the world. We were accelerating. We were starting to really develop and really build this application. Very proud of ourselves. More people joined the team. And then we had a compelling event. So full disclosure in this compelling event, it was entirely my fault. Again. I don't always test, but when I do, I test in production, and sometimes I don't tell anyone. <laughs> On that note, I encourage everyone to go review the AWS as Amazon.com security best practices and white papers. On when and how you should use identity access and management, and when and how you should not give out your administrative level API key to anyone. I'm not placing blame on anyone other than myself. I'm the one who decided to test beta services on our, on our production account. So needless to say, one afternoon, we're all sitting around, and we're planning out the next iteration on, on what features we're going to work on. And, and again, we're using this Python script to deploy our code, and we're really proud of ourselves. And everything goes down. 
All the screens go red. We can't access any of our instances in any region worldwide. We're freaking out. We're panicking. Full panic mode. Customers are down. What do we do? What do we do? So we start logging into the global health dashboard. Everything is good. Logging into the console. Everything looks good. What could this possibly be? So of course we check Twitter. Is anyone else complaining about Amazon having problems? No. Twitter's clean. What could be the problem? Now I want you to look around the room because you might be sitting next to this individual, but Riley, working on the team that day, who I love to death, raises his hand and says, guys, should security groups have rules in them? And what we realized was that this third party service that we were beta testing, when we disconnected it, it actually removed all the rules in every security group in every region worldwide. We had deny all ourselves. So now we've identified the problem, and, and immediately they took away my admin credentials. But then after that, we were faced with how do we get these systems back up online? And so luckily, Alex, he starts to giggle, and I'm, you know, what's so funny? Alex had taken it upon himself a few days in advance to dump every API describe call into a Mongo database. So he was able to print out on fun pieces of paper all the security groups that we needed to rebuild by hand in the console, which took us about three hours. Five guys jamming this stuff in. So we get that down, we get everything back up and running, they remove my admin credentials, and we stop, and we say, how can we prevent this from ever happening again? Not the Dave Winter problem, the how long does it take us to recover problem. And so what we did was we looked at infrastructure as code, and more specifically, we looked at AWS CloudFormation. And we pivoted at that moment to say, we're not working on the SaaS application, we're going to work on moving everything into infrastructure as code. We're going to code all the things. Because while we had an application that was deploying instances very rapidly, we were losing VPCs, we were losing security groups, we were losing routes. We'd have to recreate all of that by hand. But by moving to AWS CloudFormation, we'd be able to put all that in the code so that we can rapidly bring things back up and online. So the result for us was that ability to recover very quickly from any kind of outage that may have an impact on our infrastructure. A fun byproduct of that was what we noticed in the following weeks and the following months that we were iterating faster on our primary goal, building that SaaS application by using the methodologies of thinking of the application as code, of course, and now our infrastructure as code, and using the same practices across the board, the team, the five-person development team, we were iterating faster getting towards our goal. So fun side benefit. So let me switch, switch gears here a little bit. I want to talk to you about another quote, another person, Grace Hopper. Maybe some of you know. She's a famous computer scientist, built the com first compiler, also a Navy Rear Admiral. She was quoted as saying the most dangerous phrase in the language is, we've always done it that way. Going back to the beginning of the presentation, where do we come from? Where have all of us come from? Traditional inf information technology. Things are very siloed sometimes in information technology. You've got a development team. Onshore, offshore, in your backyard, at home, doesn't matter. You've got an infrastructure team. They own the data center. They're building the network. They're building the SAN. They're building the virtualization, however it goes. They run the application. Then you've got the operations team. They're the ones that have to keep the wheels on 24-7. I'm sure everyone in this room has probably been in a situation where there was some finger pointing between these groups, where there was maybe some communication breakdown or not enough discussion on the application between these groups. And what does that lead to? It leads to unhappy people, unhappy business units, unhappy customers, unhappy team members. What we found by changing our, our methodology and bringing everything, the entire stack, into code was that we now were able to deliver happy team members, happy business units, and happy customers. So what I want to do is bring Alex Corley up here on stage to talk about this concept of infrastructure as code, and more specifically, AWS CloudFormation. You go, Alex. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate it. So we're here to introduce the concept of infrastructure as code, which is the ability to define individual pieces of your infrastructure in a model controlled by version control. This allows you to combine your infrastructure and your application into a holistic methodology for deploying and updating complex systems. In the story that Dave told, we were storing the previous state of our system in a database with no real way to rebuild it. 
You know, having a reference of what your architecture was is useful, but what we really needed was a way to define what it should be. We could quickly and uh, uh, repeatedly deploy new infrastructure, but we had a little trouble updating or recreating existing ones. That's where CloudFormation came in. It's a model that represents AWS resources. A model encodes the infrastructure used in the functioning and development of an environment that provides the ability for an application to live and grow. Reality should always reflect the model. If for some reason that it doesn't, through auditing, you can detect these changes and simply update reality from the model. And before making changes on the actual living system, make sure to test the model, perform experiments, iterate on the model. You don't have to be a real programmer to learn enough JSON syntax to produce a, a template that supports your infrastructure. Even Dave can do this. There are a lot of pre-built examples out there that are production worthy. Anything from S3 buckets for artifact hosting, multi-tier web architectures, even queue worker-based systems that grow and contract dynamically according to customer demand. CloudFormation supports just about all AWS resources, everything from EC2 and S3 to custom CloudWatch metrics and log shipping for your instances. This really gives you the robust tools that you need to design a model that fits your particular solution. We were able to take the security groups from one person, the networking topology from another, and the application configuration from a third and combine them all into a single canonical source of truth. Previously, when we were storing the old state of the system in a database for reference, when we switched to CloudFormation, we started storing the intended state in version control. What this allowed us to do was detect differences between versions of our infrastructure, do things like peer code review, and even integration tests on the system as a whole. What this really allowed us to do was uh, make, make changes at any point in the system and then test those in concert. You can, you can store your versions in a repository of your choice and then push them to S3 for high availability and direct loading into cloud formation through the use of IAM security credentials that provide least privileged access to the, the resources that are used within the system. Using this same model, we were able to promote the entire architecture through the software development lifecycle, dev, stage, production, all the while main maintaining a consistent versioning and environment for both the infrastructure and the application. Also using this same template, we were able to rapidly expand our infrastructure as we brought on new customers in remote regions around the world. We were able to instantly and exactly duplicate our production infrastructure into multiple AWS regions to reduce latency and increase the customer experience. CloudFormation also took care of a lot of these things that we were attempting to spend time to write code for. It controls order of operations, dependency checking. It does multiple actions in parallel so that you don't have to write multi-threaded code just to deploy your infrastructure. It does validation and syntax checking, not only on the template, but custom input parameters that you specify, when in combination with output parameters, allows you to take multiple templates and chain them together for more complex workflows. It also allows you to define your resources in ways that make sense to you. We had a single template for global resources, such as an S3 bucket for artifacts, an SNS topic, and SQS queues for notifications and alarms. We had a single networking template that supported multiple regions with an easy to understand topology so that our operations team members could tell exactly where in the world a machine was simply by looking at the second octet of the private IP. We also had a single customer template that was used for every customer, which allowed us to easily define and duplicate what a set of customer resources looked like within our system. And because all of these resources were encapsulated at different layers, as customers came and went, we were easily able to clean up unused resources in a simple manner. Thank you, Alex. So speaking about simple, Right now, we'd like to bring out Tom Lista from Simple to talk about how they you know, it were introduced to infrastructure as code, how they adopted it, and how the benefits have helped them out. Go, Tom. Thank you, Dave. Hey, everybody. 
How's everyone doing? Uh, so I'm Tom. I'm from Simple. Uh, we're basically a, uh, a new kind of bank. Um, some of the cool stuff we have is stuff we don't have, like fees. Uh, we have great customer service. Um, people actually call in or message in sometimes just to say hello, uh, which I think is funny. And it's not something I really thought about until I had to do this talk, um, that some people actually call in to say hi to their bank. That's you know, unheard of. So anyway, Simple's been operating uh, a service-oriented architecture in AWS basically since day one. Um, we uh, were birthed in the cloud. We sort of embraced the like, zen ephemerality of it all. Uh, it's always been in our bloodstream. Uh, and recently, we embarked on a project that uh, adopts this, the infrastructure as code philosophy and also really heavily uses CloudFormation under the hood. So Dave, Dave asked me to come on stage to talk to you guys a little bit about that project. But first, some prehistory. So when Simple first started and we were in the primordial ooze, right, we, we also started out at the console. Um, every single security group, instance, IAM profile, auto scaling group, all of it was lovingly handcrafted by our operations artisans over in Portland, Oregon. Uh, and as you can guess, that this was just completely untenable after a while. Um, as we deployed more services, as we developed more features, uh, it was really difficult to just conduct the changes, let alone record them later in an issue tracker. And so, actually, the other day, I was looking at our old issue tracker, and I found a bunch of tickets that just asked, like, is this security group been changed? Is this instance deployed? It was a very dark time. I mean, we didn't know it at the time, but it was a very, very dark time. And then came this new requirement, which is called PCI. Um, to not get too into it, PCI is a set of like, rules and regulations that uh, your infrastructure has to follow if it's going to uh, carry or transmit sensitive financial information like card numbers, account numbers, all that juicy stuff. And the thing is, when we looked at the requirements and we laid them out, uh, it was such a massive change for the infrastructure that we decided, well, we might as well just start from scratch. But we didn't you know, hang our heads in shame or anything like that. We thought about, like, well, what do we want from the infrastructure? If we're going to start from scratch, let's at least do it our way, too. So we laid out all the requirements that PCI requires and all the requirements we want out of the system and tried to figure out you know, how can we build a compromise. So we came up with four like, major goalposts. Uh, the first is really obvious, and it's security. Uh, basically, we wanted to take like, really, really tight control, I mean, maximum paranoia mode, uh, on our inter-service communications. So everything is, has to be explicitly whitelisted if you want to communicate between services. Uh, we also had to like, move from EC2 Classic at the time to VPC. Uh, and in that, we also you know, develop subnets that are critical or non-critical and stuff like that. The second is Insight, which is really just a fancy word for scanning things. Uh, you have to scan, like basically you have to trust every single bit that you push to production uh, if you're under PCI. So this means like scanning AMIs, scanning the actual service binaries that you're going to deploy. All of this stuff has to be totally trustworthy and scannable and everything when you push to prod. The third is growth. Uh, and so like I said, Simple has been service oriented since day one. Uh, and all the engineers in our organization, no matter what practice, like internal, mobile, data, analytics, whatever, if you have a problem or a feature you want to release, you're probably going to write a service to solve it. We encourage everybody to write a service. And so we wanted the system to sort of take care of that growth, right? We wanted to make sure that uh, when you're adding a new service, it's not going to be a problem. And then the fourth is speed, uh, which I think personally is one of the more crucial parts of this. Uh, and one of the things that infrastructure as code buys us, one of the most beneficial things. Uh, so normally PCI is like a pox on most companies. A lot of companies try to like sweep the problem under the rug uh, and like build a shell company, uh, put infrastructure under that, and that infrastructure goes under all these like really icky human processes of auditing and reporting and approving, getting approval from people. Like, just so complicated. And honestly, we wanted to do this at first, you know, and like slow down our deploys, like, parts of our system. But then, you know, we're the bank, right? Like, it's part of our feature set that we have your card number and we do fun things with it. So we have no option to do that. Um, and what's funny is after we adopted the whole infrastructure as code stuff, uh, I think we deploy today now like 10 times more than we did before. So then we found CloudFormation, right? And uh, CloudFormation had pretty much everything we were looking for, right? It could set up the VPCs. It could handle you know, pointing AMIs to where they should go, deploying instances, auto-scaling groups, 
Uh, like Alex said, when he went through the science of infrastructure as code, you know, you can have a model that you update, keep in version control, all this stuff. We thought it was amazing and it had everything we wanted. However, we want to take things a step further. So we wrote this small Python program called CloudBank. And CloudBank is basically two parts. It's one part the representation of Simple's infrastructure in Python code, and another part is more Python code to sort of transform this representation from you know, Simple's rep down to CloudFormation templates, right? Down to the CloudFormation model. And this was huge. Uh, I'm actually personally so surprised how beneficial this, this idea was. Uh, this allowed all of our engineers at Simple to contribute to the infrastructure, right? Because our engineers know which service houses user data, which service houses transaction data. You know, they know which parts need to connect. So they can just hop into CloudBank, right? It's just Python code, edit some stuff, you know, put up a pull request through our, through our GitHub system, and then all we have to do on our side is just do a CloudFormation update. And CloudFormation takes care of all the dirty work. Security groups get changed, IAM profiles get changed if they need to. All that stuff just gets handled by CloudFormation, and it's really great. And so here's an example of one of our front-end engineers, Reed, uh, adding a dependency to a front-end service. And as you can see, all you have to do is just append a string to an array. It's that simple. And here's an example of what our Jenkins cluster looks like when represented in CloudBank. I'm sure everyone has something like this or something horribly more complicated, which we used to have. Um, and you can basically read it. It's almost English. Like, there's a topology, it has a Jenkins master, it's named Jenkins, it has a Jenkins worker group, which really is just an auto-scaling group under the hood, right? Like, there's other parts that compile that down to that. Um, and then we have this authorized API, which, you know, just says that the worker can communicate with the master on a certain port. And notice, nothing here is talking about security groups or anything. It's is all our terminology, we own this stuff. All right, so how does this all work? Well. When I joined this project in the infancy days, um, I first, you know, what I usually do when I join a new product project is I try to look for similar projects out there. And um, I couldn't find anything, unfortunately. So then I got into my other mode of joining a new project, which is like squinting really, really hard and trying to figure out if this looks kind of like something else at all. And I thought, you know, this kind of looks like a compiler, right? Like this is a little bit, like it's taking one thing and transforming it to another thing. And so I looked at you know, the LLVM project, which I was like, okay, let's just see if I can steal anything from this group, and, uh, and I did. Uh, so they have this great idea of a pass, right? And we have a form of that in CloudBank, which basically um, a pass allows you like, some time to look at the entire topology of your infrastructure and mutate it to set some kind of standards or whatever guarantees you want to ensure, right? So for example, we have you know, applying standard block devices. A lot of our operations tooling like expects certain standards of block devices on certain instance types. So we do that there. Another example is like making sure that the security groups look legit and they actually have rules in them, right? Another example is uh, like generating instance user data, which we use. Um, but I, actually, a more interesting example uh, that we recently just implemented. Uh, was that the finance team started asking us to buy more reserved instances. And all we had to do was just, you know, whip up a cloud bank pass to yell at the user if you're not using reserved instances or if you're using an instance type that we're not going to approve. All right, so what are all the benefits? Right? I'm going to write a, a, a compiler for the cloud. Like, this seems a little bit complicated, but, like, why should I do it? I think the benefits are obvious, right? You write code every day. Um, you know exactly how to work with it, right? You can use the same tools, right? Um, so Alex was talking about using Git to version control your CloudFormation model. Um, and I can't stress how cool that is. I'm going to go off topic for a quick second. Um, but there's this research project that we're working on over at Simple, which um, will allow us to sort of, we can pass in a Git revision, right? Either a branch or like one from the past or whatever. And it would spin up a test version of the environment uh, run integration tests, run scans, run everything, right? And then we can get like an approved clear report that like this version of the infrastructure from the binaries to the OS are totally cool and we can always roll back there in case of like an emergency or anything like that, which I think is just super great. Another thing is that 
code is programmable. So you know, when PCI comes out with a new standard, all we're going to do is just write a cloud bank pass for that. We're not going to set up some weird, awkward process where humans have to approve things. We're not going to do that, because that's just going to slow us down, right? Let's just have the code do the dirty work. And we have the opportunity to do that now that our, code, our infrastructure is just in code. And I think the most important one is the fact that code is like really familiar. Like I said, you know, everyone knows how to work with code. Um, I can't tell you how beneficial it is now that all of our engineers can understand and contribute to the infrastructure. Um, it, you know, it makes it self-service so that when you need to deploy a new service, you know, as an engineer, as a front-end engineer, back-end, whoever, you can just send a pull request and ask for your changes to be done. You know, we go through uh, the code review process and all that, but it's, it's what we do already today, so it's not really like an interruption or anything like that. Um, and I think the whole infrastructure as code philosophy, it's really important to simple now, and I honestly have to thank David for uh, having me do this, because it wasn't until I enumerated uh, all these benefits that we've gotten from adopting this uh, that, you know, now that we have everything in code and we can quickly, rapidly iterate on it uh, safely, it feels like simple can stay the nimble company that it was, you know, two years ago when we were just 20 people. Uh, to the company that we are today, which is 200 people. Uh, and I think that's pretty awesome. And that's all I got. So thanks, everybody. Thank you, Tom. So, so you've heard Alex and I's story um, and where we kind of got into infrastructure as code. And then you just had a chance to hear Tom's story about how they came about infrastructure as code and the benefits that we both found from that. But what we'd like to do in finishing out the presentation today is actually show you a demonstration to try to really drive home what we're talking about when it comes to uh, how infrastructure code can affect all these silos in your organization. So I'll turn this over to Alex. All right. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate that. So uh, a little hard to see here because the resolution, but essentially what we have is a demo application that most people will be familiar with. You can liken this to a web application, some sort of service-oriented architecture. But essentially, in theory, what we have is a cluster of five machines that are attempting to connect to the server. And we have a series of problems to kind of enumerate the philosophy of this infrastructure as code. Uh, the first one here, we've got them on, on the right here, as you'll see things red, they'll turn green as we solve these problems. Um, we have an application issue. So everyone's familiar with the process of committing code and, and pushing for, for application usage. So I'm just going to go through and do that real quick so that we have a basis to kind of build our story on. So what I have is a git repo on an EC2 instance just kind of sitting there. And so we, we know that we have a, an application problem. So uh, I'm pretty sure it's the graph size because our unit test pretty much told us that the, uh, the graph was missized. And so if we go into the JavaScript code here and slightly increase the size, you can see that uh, the difference here, we've changed things from uh, 100 to 400. So just as we've been saying, version control, everything, let's, let's commit this with a, with a graph fix. And then go ahead and deploy our, our UI. So if, if we come back to the main page here, you can see as we adjust that, uh, not only is the graph increased, but our, our unit test on the right went green from red. Well, as I said earlier, there should be a cluster of five machines connecting to this server, but for some reason, there's only one. I'm assuming someone pushed the development security groups to production, right? Only limiting to one instance. So let's actually go in and look at the CloudFormation template that we're using to, uh, to do this. We've got an elastic load balancer security group, and as you can see, there's a single IP with a net mask of 32. Uh, not much use for a, a production system. So let's go ahead and actually open that up quite a bit to, to allow other, other users to connect. I didn't tell them to do that. Uh, this is a, a publicly facing load balancer. I don't see any reason. And as you can see, uh, again, with, with the infrastructure, uh, we're, we're making commits, we're diffing the changes, and seeing what's going on. 
So actually, let's uh, deploy that first so that we can see the changes come up. Because sometimes you actually do uh, pre-commit hooks for Git, and you want to do integration tests, basic sanity checking before you ever push your infrastructure. So there we have that. And as we uh, come back over to the main page here, as that CloudFormation is actually updating, in real time we should actually see multiple IP addresses really start filtering in. And on the back end here, it's essentially a, a Dynamo DB table that's taking unique IPs and, and incrementing a counter, uh, relatively simple. And there we have uh, extra IPs showing up. Uh, just as an extra example, we can programmatically clear the entire database, instantly causing the graph to kind of rescale and, and give us a lot better visibility there. Um, so our, our application and our, our security unit tests are green, uh, but apparently we have an infrastructure problem. There's inf insufficient throughput according to what we were really expecting the system to do. So uh, as, as we showed earlier, the custom input parameters on the CloudFormation template allow you to essentially wrap an API layer around your entire infrastructure. So what I'm going to do with a single command here is actually double the size of my infrastructure from five machines to 10. And as you can see in the template, that's a, uh, a custom parameter at the top that allows you to pass in variables that you can then reuse throughout your infrastructure and the application level. Now this action actually takes the longest because essentially what we're doing is taking a base Amazon Linux AMI with no changes whatsoever, bootstrapping artifacts from S3, doing some basic service configuration, and then starting those services so that they can participate in the demo. Um, a couple other things to keep in mind is that you know, not only are we doing unit tests on our infrastructure, we're actually doing business development uh, or business driven development at the same time, right? We have a predefined set of criteria that we're then attempting to get our infrastructure to match and pass those tests. Okay, so what you're seeing here is the fact that we took three separate problems. We took an application problem, we took a security problem, and we took an infrastructure problem. And you saw exactly the way that, that Alex handled each of these. He identified that there was a problem. He went and found the piece of code where he thought the problem could be fixed at. He committed the code, tested the code, or in reverse order, and, and then pushed that code into production to fix the problem. Traditionally, going back to those silos, you might be working with different teams, going through different change management models. One team might not know exactly how the other team is going to fix the problem. But in this case, as I said, the same process spanned those silos of infrastructure, application, and security. Mm -hmm. So hopefully any second here, we'll actually see this refresh, and the infrastructure, uh, the infrastructure issue should actually clear up here. And this is all a live demo with uh, production infrastructure. So these are things that you know, do take a little time. Uh, a few things that you can do is optimize your AMI process to really pre-bake all of these things in here. Uh, I w actually wanted to take as many chances as possible to actually prove that these things were uh, happening in real time. And as you can see, we now have extra IPs showing up in the uh, graph. And again, I'm going to programmatically clear the database just to give a rescale of things so that you can see what's going on. And so as you can see when the page reloads, all of our unit tests are now green. So we, we took our infrastructure and treated it exactly the same as our application code, uh, made a commit, pushed the changes, and then everything went live. So again, solving application problems, solving security problems, solving infrastructure problems, identically the same way infrastructure as code. So let's switch back here. Uh, slide. Sorry. So you might be asking yourself, you know, who is infrastructure as code really for? And the answer is everyone and anyone. From the, the smaller startups that are looking to maintain their agile edge, to be fast and nimble, 
trying to get a product to market first or better. Infrastructure as code allows you to really concentrate on the product, bring a lot of developers together, allow them to run the entire project, run the entire application and infrastructure. And the enterprises might be saying, well, how does this benefit us? Enterprises want to be very rigid and secure, right? a lot of compliance that they're very concerned about, large-scale large applications, thousands of applications. When you're an enterprise architect and your CTO or CIO comes and says, I want to move 1,000 enterprise applications into the cloud this year, you don't do 1,000 one-off migrations into the cloud. You come up with a pattern. Using, using infrastructure as code, you can come up with a template-driven pattern for your various architectures that can be curated by your enterprise architecture team and allow these departments in the enterprise to rapidly either adopt for new development applications or take their existing applications and make them work inside the sanctioned templates and move them to the cloud. Guaranteed, any enterprise you talk to that's moving, rapidly moving applications in the cloud is in some way, shape, or form leveraging infrastructure as code. So to sum this all up, you really can do things differently. You really can break the mold and think because of how the cloud is enabling you on how you can build applications in a different manner, how you can develop your, app, your, your infrastructure in a different manner, and bring it all together. Think about them all as the project when you're developing your applications. Infrastructure as code is something that I'm very passionate about. Alex and Tom are very passionate about. We encourage you to go off and experiment and learn and play with it. There's a lot of different options that fall under this concept of infrastructure as code. We concentrated on one today, AWS CloudFormation, quite a bit. But there's other things out there, OpsWorks, uh, you know, SDS which is being released. Uh, so, so go out there and explore and experiment. Please, if you want to reach out to your Amazon account manager, your Amazon solution architect, I'm sure they'd love to talk to you about the topics. If you'd like to reach out to Alex or Tom and I, we'd love for you to buy us a beer and we'd be happy to talk about the topics as well. So we've got a little bit of time left, so if there's any questions and answers, we'd love to field them. Yes? Uh, I'll just like go over it really quickly. The question was, uh, how do you make sure that the application versions are also good when you're uh, verifying that there's a known good revision of your infrastructure? Uh, part of that is the way that Simple's architected is we use instance data uh, to provide what binary should be running on a box. So since instance data is immutable and that's also hard coded into the CloudFormation template, we know that that version is good on that AMI. So that's how we would bake that in. Again, this is just a research project, so we're just like figuring it out. But that's correct. Immutable infrastructure is what we deploy today. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Another question? Yes. Cloud bank. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Can't hear you. Sorry. I think it's for me. Yes. You can, so, so it's a great question. Uh, the question was, uh, is CloudBank, would you classify it as a DSL layer on top of CloudFormation? Uh, yes. I mean, I'm a little allergic to the word DSL because I never really had great time with any of them. So we just have, like, straight up Python code. There's no, like, syntax or anything weird like that. Uh, it's, my coworkers would call it a small Python library, and that's what I will call it, too. Thank you.